Okay. Our next speaker is Yakub Kare from UCLA. Thank you, Mason and Heather, um, for inviting me to speak at the symposium. And hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yakub. Um, I'm going to be discussing um, some work that I did with my collaborators, uh, Vito and Luigi at Motivo Inc., um, in which we apply topological data analysis to integrated circuit layouts. Sorry, there we go. Um, so just to get a brief outline of the talk, I'm gonna briefly describe the IC design process. I'm gonna talk about the defects that can arise in manufacturing. I'm gonna talk about the problem of physical uh, design verification, and then the data that we'll be studying. Um, then I'll talk very briefly about TDA. Hopefully everybody has an idea about it. Um, and then very specifically, I'll mention what Betty plots are, um, but I think you now have an idea of what those are. Um, and then we're gonna start applying TDA to the data from integrated circuits. I'm gonna mention uh, a, few, uh, a few things that we learned about the IC design manufacturing process um, from doing TDA on uh, data from integrated circuits. And then lastly, I'll just recap about some of our main results and mention some future work. So this is definitely some ongoing work, yeah. Thank you. Um, so just to give a very high level uh, view of what goes into uh, manufacturing uh, integrated circuits or what some people just call chips. Um, on the left here, we have uh, a sample layout of random logic. So this is, you know, you're building a semiconductor uh, integrated circuit and you're trying to design essentially where the circuitry goes out and you need to develop basically a blueprint. So this is a very small bit of a blueprint. Um, modern IC devices, the ones that are in your phones, are massive. Um, they have billions of components. Um, so this is, this is very just a, a very small uh, snippet of one bit of that. Um, but what we see here is there's a lot of geometric kind of arrangements that are going into these things. These are now not just designed by somebody basically drawing this out like an architect, but there's a lot of uh, computer-aided design systems that are used to help people um, develop these. So this is, again, a very small example, but it, it illustrates um, essentially what goes into this process of designing an integrated circuit. You essentially draw out the circuitry that goes in, and, and then eventually that's going to get sent to the fabrication plant, where this gets printed in a process known as photolithography. So that's printing with light. Um, so in that process with printing with lights, there's a lot of room for error. Um, essentially, defects can show up when you're trying to print something. So you have what your intended design is, and then you have what the result is. Um, so on the right here, we have some examples of defects that can show up. So in the dotted line, that's essentially what we might intend to draw or intend to sort of get with the manufacturing process. And the red orange blobs show what might actually be printed by light. So depending on what type of things you're intending to draw, different types of errors might happen. Um, in this sort of zigzag type pattern, if you turn too sharply, light might actually end up, you know, sort of missing out on some of the pieces, especially the turn, which might lead to uh, a separation of components, which would cause your uh, circuit not to work. Another type of problem is if you build things too closely, they might end up merging. So because of the randomness of lights and the, the high sensitivity of printing with light, these types of defects are things that we need to be cognizant of when we're designing the layout. So there's things that we learn from, you know, actually just doing these things. And then there's things that we might know from just, you know, understanding that there's gonna be inherent, uh, inherent issues. So in designing the layout, we have certain criteria that we need to meet. We might need to meet certain things like performance and size. We, we have things like Moore's Law, which essentially tells us, you know, we need to constantly be packing more and more um, transistors and whatnot onto smaller and smaller circuits. Um, so there's all these other criteria. But in addition to having that, you need to continue to actually be able to build these things with light. So as that technology improves in terms of, you know, we're able to print with light that has smaller wavelengths, there's still going to be this, this uh, type of error that we need to be aware of. So. We're gonna first focus on uh, basically this small s segment um, highlighted in purple um, from the layout. So this is where we're gonna start looking at uh, the actual arrangements. So in the design uh, manufacturing process, once the layout is drawn, there's this process called physical verification. And in physical verification, 
the most standard uh, thing that people do is look at uh, simple design rule checks. So these simple design rule checks essentially check one or two dimensional tolerance limits. So the type of uh, problem that we discussed on the previous slide where we had two things that were printed close to each other, we need to have a certain tolerance limit. We know that you know, if we build things too close to each other, there's a probability that's you know, non-negligible that things might start merging. So we have certain tolerance limits saying, don't build components too close to each other because we want to sort of make sure that that doesn't happen. And there's obviously, you know, since this is such a large system and you're compounding the, the probability for these events to happen and you want to avoid them, we have pretty high uh, tolerance limits for avoiding those things. But that's not the only kind of problem that occur. These are, again, one dimensional checks. But as we saw with the other uh, kind of defect, there's more complicated arrangements such as a zigzag which might lead to different kinds of defects. So we need to move beyond essentially having these just simple kind of checks into something more, uh, more robust, uh, especially for something that's complex like the, the modern uh, IC devices. So the direction that uh, semiconductor manufacturing and design people are going in is using something called pattern matching. So essentially a pattern is looking at a snippet of an IC layout and looking at the abstract um, arrangement of those things. So as we look at this purple uh, highlighted bit, we can sort of extract that and uh, reduce that into a pattern by uh, this decomposition process. So we look at that snippet, we decompose it into cells by extending um, all the lines. Um, and then with that decomposition, we turn shaded cells into ones and then unshaded cells, which is essentially the empty space into zeros. And that gives us a binary matrix. We use this as a generic sense of the pattern that appears. So there's gonna be two things that I'm talking about. There's gonna be things called patterns and there's gonna be things called configurations. So a pattern is the abstract arrangement where we just have the, the binary matrix. Once we specify in addition to the, the arrangement, the actual dimensions, so in this case, the X1, the X2, and the Y1, once we specify those dimensions, you know, if they're one nanometer or two nanometers, that gives us a specific configuration. So a configuration is a realization of a pattern with specific dimensions. So the idea that we're gonna be exploring here is how do we use patterns and configurations that we extract from an IC layout in order to improve our understanding of whether something's gonna be printable or not. So just to give you a brief rundown of you know, why we're interested in this, uh, design rules, so these are the, the one dimensional um, or two dimensional uh, types of checks, they really only give us a sense of two to 15% of the like overall design space of an, a layout. So, you know, doing these design rule checks is useful. I mean, it gives us some, some grounding of whether uh, something's gonna be manufacturable, but it does not give us anywhere, you know, near what we need to know before we start sending things to uh, the fabrication plan printing things. So the next thing that people typically do is actually just start building test chips. So these are where you essentially take a, uh, like a fraction of your uh, product chip. So you might take like some top left corner, it depends on you know, how, how much of it you want to test, and you actually just test that circuitry. Now, again, this gives you more information because you're looking at something larger and you're actually manufacturing it, but you're not gonna see the entire design space. You're not gonna see the whole layout. So you still don't know between uh, basically 50 and 95% uh, of what's going on in your chip. So Doing these two methods isn't actually sufficient um, for the full product design process. You end up you know, sending your chip to the uh, fabrication plant and you try to print it, and you end up having essentially no knowledge of the yield for most of the uh, design space. And this process can be very costly. Um, sending something from uh, the design lab to the uh, fabrication plant, that takes time and cost, and this process can end up taking uh, six months to two years before you, know, you actually have a uh, product chip that you can send out um, in iPhones and whatnot. So the goal here is to sort of improve that first step where we can actually determine whether something's gonna be manufacturable at an early stage before we have to start introducing uh, these more costly uh, methods. So some of the work that's been done before uh, has been just strictly looking at comparing the patterns that do appear in IC layout. So say you have two designs, design A and design B, you might know that design A is manufacturable and design B is the new design. And you want to know, is design B going to be manufacturable? 
Well, you look at the patterns that appear in them and you say, okay, well, maybe if enough patterns appear in, uh, if there's enough patterns that appear in both, then we can say pattern B or design B is going to be manufacturable because we know design A was manufacturable. But in the process of making these designs, you know, as I said, these things are huge and they're, they're done mostly by computers doing uh, lots of like random optimization and gradient descent type stuff. And the patterns that end up appearing in both are actually quite, you know, uh, rare. Only around 6% uh, of patterns between two designs might have, uh, might be in common. So this is not really the direction that's been entirely useful. It has been useful to some extent, but the direction that we need to continue to go in is to see if there's some other way of uh, looking at these things. The next step people have been looking at, so that was patterns. Now, the next step is to actually use the configuration. So this is the pattern with the actual dimensional data. So this is actually knowing the X1 and the Y1 for a specific pattern or, or the other uh, parameters that go into it. So we might look at a specific pattern that does appear in both designs and we might ask, okay, well, with that information, do we now have some better sense of, is this pattern gonna be printable? We might start saying, okay, well, high dimensional patterns, you know, the ones that have lots of dimensions that go into them, we don't have to worry about them. Maybe we'll just focus on the smaller ones, but even the small ones, which do appear in both, there's still a lot of room for differences in terms of the configuration, the actual X1 and uh, Y1 uh, parameters. So when we start comparing these, we might look at this thing called the coverage. Um, so the coverage is essentially just plotting out all the configurations that appear in the designs for a specific pattern. And we look here, we have a design A and a design B again. We might know that one of the designs is manufacturable and the other one is the new design that we're looking at. And we see that, okay, design B is sort of a subset of design A. So if design A is manufacturable, then we don't really need to worry about the specific pattern. But things, you know, can get a little bit hairy with this. Um, so, you know, we might learn from design A that, you know, we can actually go down to this, like, uh, dimensions. So this is a design that's not covered by design B. So if the, if the roles were flipped, if the design B was the one that was manufacturable and design A was the one that we're worried about, you know, there's these new configurations that are appearing on our design that we haven't seen before. So we have all these new questions about them. And then there's also this other issue. So a specific configuration can appear in a design multiple times. So there's this, you know, additional factor of, you know, just knowing this count of a specific configuration actually change our, um, intuition about whether something's going to be manufacturable. For example, there might be a specific configuration that appears in design A, you know, 10 million times and it only appears in design B once. So even if design B was manufacturable, you know, maybe it was because that configuration is problematic, but it only appeared once. So the error wasn't triggered. Whereas, you know, it's appearing in design A 10 million times. So we have to be a little bit more um, wary of this. So the way I'm drawing the, the designs, uh, sorry, the, the coverage is here, it's a bit cartoonish. So in reality, the actual coverage isn't, you know, these, these polygonal shapes, it's a bunch of points. Um, so that, that's the actual data that we're gonna be looking at. So this is the, the configuration or coverage space. Um, so for each pattern, there's gonna be a point cloud associated with it that gives you essentially all the configurations that appear. And this is not a point cloud in the set sense, but a point cloud in the multi-set sense. So that's something that we're gonna to need to uh, think about as we, as we start looking at this. So the polygonal shape that we have here, this is supposed to give us a sense of maybe what might be an approximate safe region. We observed these in a manufacturable design, you know, these specific points. Does that mean stuff that appears relatively close to those configurations? Is that something that's also gonna be manufacturable? Now, the issue with that is, what's this approximation that we're going to be looking at? You know, how, how do we draw this polygon? Is there some natural scale? You know, does it have to do with our risk tolerance? So something that we'd really like to do is be able to get this in a multi-scale sense. So something that we can, you know, consider this over a range of approximations. So this is where we're starting to think about things like filtrations or uh, filtered simplicial complexes. The problem can be even more difficult once we start considering higher dimensional patterns. Um, once we, you know, add additional dimensions, it becomes very difficult to do this if, you know, we're just looking at scatter plots because, you know, realistically, maybe we can view three-dimensional scatter plots, but, you know, probably not. Two-dimensional scatter plots, we're going to start having to do a lot of projections, and that can hide a lot of the, the things that we might be worried about. And when you add these extra dimensions, things can start happening in these sort of safe spaces. You know, when we start looking at the safe region where there's, you know, uh, where we approximate things that, you know, 
we think it'll be okay if we have configurations in this sort of yellow highlighted region. There might be holes that show up there. So this is, you know, these are the things that sort of led us to thinking maybe TDA might be something that could be helpful in studying this data. So I think everybody's now had a bit of a background on uh, homology and uh, TDA, I guess, in general, but just to, again, give a brief idea of what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna be focusing mostly on Betty numbers. Um, essentially, that gives you a classification of spaces. So the Betty numbers um, basically are indexed from zero to, I guess, over the natural numbers, as giving you a count of the number of homo homological features that correspond to, you know, for the ith Betty number, it'd be the number of i-dimensional holes. So, uh, except for the case of zero, where that actually just gives you the number of components, or as we call them, clusters. So in the uh, little graphic we have on the left, there are four components and there are two holes that appear in them. You could also use TDA. This actually covers, you know, high dimensional cavities, at one, et cetera, but we're gonna be mostly focusing on the zero and first Betty numbers. So just to give you a very, you know, cartoonish again drawing of, of how this goes, we have six points on the left. The way we develop a uh, Betty plot where we're gonna look at the Betty numbers as we evolve them over the resolution parameter epsilon, essentially the idea here is we're thickening the points with balls of radius epsilon. Once the balls start intersecting, we add uh, edges and faces, and that's gonna give us the, the filtration that we're looking at. So as we see here, we're gonna continue thickening the, thickening the balls, and that's gonna introduce edges. And once you introduce edges, things like holes might show up, and things like number of components will be reduced. Um, and then we're gonna capture that information in what we call a Betty plot. So, Quick example, uh, this is the Betty plot of coverage data that we saw before from that uh, pattern that we have in the middle right there. So we take our coverage data and then we look at the Betty numbers of it. Full disclosure, the, the way we're doing this right now with the uh, point cloud, we're not using the fact that it's a multi-set points that appear multiple times. We're just gonna count that as appearing once because from that perspective, we can't really uh, we don't necessarily have the tools to sort of incorporate that information. So we're just taking uh, the point cloud, converting it into a set, ignoring multiplicities, and then turning that into um, a Betty plot. So this is sort of what we see. Um, it's a very discrete type of function. This has to do with the fact that um, the uh, layout actually adheres to a certain grid. Um, so it's, it causes a discreteness that we can end up seeing in the, uh, in the Betty numbers, in the Betty plot. So we're going to actually try to use the multiplicities um, in one quick example, and this is for what we're calling clipping subsampling. So as I mentioned, when we do test chips, the idea is that you take a region of your full layout and you try to test that. Now, a statistically equivalent way of doing this would be to just take configurations that are multiplicity weighted. If you do that type of subsampling, we see that Betty plots are actually somewhat robust to subsampling when you incorporate multiplicity. When we start subsampling at lower and lower uh, rates, we still see the same qualitative uh, curves. They're lower resolution. Sometimes you start losing things, um, especially in the higher um, Betty numbers, like even the first homology, once you start uh, sampling really low, you start losing things. But this is vastly different from the results you would see if you took in uh, an unweighted uh, subsampling, treating the point cloud as just a set. In that situation, you actually don't see this sort of high, um, high fidelity. In doing this, we're actually also able to compare the con coverage of different patterns. Um, so we can just take two uh, patterns coverage data and start comparing them. You could just look at the scatter plots, but as I mentioned, you know, scatter plots are very difficult to look at um, once you go into higher dimensions. And even ones like this, it's kind of, you know, it's difficult to say this is going to be similar to this one. Um, now, there's ways of comparing point clouds generically, but that can be very expensive. So what we tried to do here is just take our point clouds, convert them to Betty plots, and then treat these as uh, essentially functions um, of epsilon. And then we can create a distance function on those Betty functions. Um, and using a uh, discrete cosine transform, that's the way that we're going to look at these functions. We can then just take the distance between them and Using that, we compute a distance, um, in this case, that's 10 to the minus four. And these are patterns that we would expect to be similar um, based on the design manufacturing process. Um, now we're gonna compare two patterns that are unrelated. We see from their scatter plots that the patterns um, have very different coverage data. In this situation, 
uh, the distance here is um, about 40 times greater from uh, what we saw in the previous example where we had two uh, patterns that we expected to be related. Now we're going to compare two patterns that we expect to be dissimilar. Um, this is patterns where we take a 90-degree uh, rotation. Um, we look at the scatter plots, the scatter plots are very different. We look at the Betty plots, the Betty plots are even more different than we saw in the sort of unrelated example here. We have a distance of 0 0.01, which is 100 times larger than the first comparison. I'm just going to give a very brief bit more background about the IC design manufacturing process. Um, so I've been, I, I don't know if I've actually mentioned that, but essentially there are layers to an IC um, device. There's going to be uh, metal layers, contact layers, and bias. Um, so far, we've just been looking at the, the meta layers, but um, there's all these other things that we can look at. I just want to mention briefly, so when you're comparing different layers, these layers actually come in pairs because of um, this design for manufacturability paradigm. There's a certain sense in which you want to sort of add things in pairs so that you can reuse uh, patterns between uh, adjacent uh, layers. So what we actually know from that paradigm is that uh, adjacent layers are gonna have orthogonal, um, or I would say maybe transpose symmetry. And then once you go down uh, like from layer five to layer three, we might expect those layers to actually become similar again. So there's sort of this uh, parity that happens between uh, meta layers. So I'm just gonna refer reference that uh, briefly um, in this next slide. So this is when we're gonna actually do a systematic comparison. So we're gonna look at the Betty plot distance from one pattern um, to a bunch of different patterns. So we're gonna take this specific pattern from the metal five layer and compare it to a bunch of different patterns. Um, so in the leftmost grouping, um, separated by the red bars, this is where we're looking at clipping subsampling. So as I mentioned before, as you take smaller and smaller subsamples, you end up with an increasing distance. This sort of is just a sanity check. Something else that we might do is compare a pattern to its child patterns. Um, the relationship between a parent pattern and its child patterns is essentially a child pattern contains the parent pattern as a sub-pattern. So these are, child patterns are larger patterns that contain their parents. So in this situation, we might want to compare two larger patterns coverage data to its parent pattern to see which type of pattern is more similar to its parents. And we're able to actually do that type of comparison. So these are patterns that might actually be of different dimensions. They might have different geometrical uh, uh, geometrical arrangements that are very different from each other, but we're still able to have a way of comparing them. Uh, in the next grouping, we're comparing different layers. As I mentioned, we're looking at layer five, that's the original data, and we're comparing it to data from level uh, metal three and metal four. As we would expect, metal three is more similar to metal four. We can look at rotations and flips. And again, we're gonna see stuff that we would expect to see from the manufacturer design process. So this is actually giving us a lot of sanity checks things are very consistent with what we know from that manufacturing process. And in the last two groups, we have uh, some, some kind of baseline checks where we look at randomly chosen patterns and see you know, the coverage data is actually very different if, you don't, you know, if you're just choosing patterns um, at random. Then we also think about synthetic data. Um, these are data that were constructed to uh, sort of optimally look like um, to replicate the coverage data. And we see that we're actually able to replicate the coverage data quite well with using uh, Gaussian, uh, Gaussian data. So this is something that might be useful in terms of giving us some sense of how we might use uh, synthetic data to make tests later on. So just to wrap up, um, physical verification for uh, IC is a pretty involved process. Right now, there's not that many great tools for doing physical verification. It ends up being very low dimensional checks, which ends up being costly. This is why you have to wait pretty long for, you know, a new iPhone, new technology to appear. It's because you're going back and forth between the design process and the manufacturing process where you, know, you have to go through this cycle several times. But if we can you know, improve the cycle at the, you know, at the design stage, we might be able to sort of speed up this process of uh, you know, knowing whether something's gonna be manufacturable. Essentially, what we see here is TDA provides a way to analyze this high dimensional uh, data at multiple resolutions. Uh, specifically using Betty plots, we were able to get like a robust signature of coverage data that we were able to compare efficiently. And we can start using this uh, comparison possibly to improve our uh, design rule checks. We might be able to start at least writing three-dimensional, four-dimensional design rule checks by doing like an exhaustive comparison. Um, some of the things we were able to see, consistency checks, we got a lot of sanity checks. We were able to um, recover things from the design manufacturing process. 
and notably without having to input any sort of additional information. It's strictly from uh, just what we were able to do here. So some future work, um, there's a lot of progress being made in TDA um, and persistent homology in terms of extracting boundaries. Um, so this would be useful for going back to sort of that original problem where we might want to, you know, look at the uh, safe regions. We might be able to sort of do that automatically once we have uh, the, the tools that we're able to extract uh, boundaries or, or what are called representative cycles from uh, persistent homology. So yeah, cool. Um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Dmitry Morozov for making his uh, TDA software Dionysus too. Um, it's very useful. Highly recommend it. Um, thank you all for listening. And now I'd like to open the floor. Thank you very much. Thanks, Akub. Um, so if um, any of you have questions, please ping Heather or me and we will, we will call on you. Um, do you have any on your end? I don't have any on my end yet. Not so far. Okay. Um, let me ask a quick question myself. Um, could you show your conclusion slide? Oh, wait, sorry, there is a question. All right, so, so Corey, why don't you um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so I, um, I don't know too much about topological data analysis just yet. Uh, I, I'm more of a data-driven dynamic systems person. And so just a tangential question of maybe there's some potential research overlap there uh, would be if there's any way to in real time uh, um, have some sort of um, defect detection. Uh, so you're doing some sort of uh, uh, pre-processing before it goes to the manufacturing. But maybe mm -hmm. there, there could be some sort of local in local data collection in the manufacturing process that could say there's likely to be a defect here. Can we take a closer look? Would that be useful? That's a great question. I'm not exactly sure what uh, is done during the manufacturing process, whether they're able to sort of do this live detection of whether, you know, as they're printing, did a, an error that could cause, um, you know, merging or breaking, can that, can that be detected live? I'm not exactly sure if that's something that's possible. Um, I think they, they do try to uh, monitor the process live, but I think because the types of defects can also be very complicated, the ones I showed are pretty simple, it might be just as complicated to sort of determine whether a defect happened live. Um, so right. I'm not exactly sure, but that, that's actually a very interesting thing. I think there's also some difficulties though in terms of uh, basically how you would look at this because when you're printing with light, essentially you're etching the semiconductor, um, the silicon, and I don't know whether it's possible to sort of take a picture of these um, as it's being printed, because my understanding is it's essentially printed, but then there's all this dust that gets removed in the next stage. So you might be printing everything first, and by the time you're able to sort of take a picture of it, you've sort of done everything. So I'm not exactly sure whether those things can be done, but that's a great question. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. It looks like we have some questions on my end. I um, had one from R.S. Asad. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I think I have missed, uh, but I have a question. When you compare your Betty curves, uh, when you have the, mm. the two scatter plots and you have your uh, Betty curves, uh, um, I mean, um, Yes, thank you. So you say they are different, but do we know which one is better? Because uh, yes, you say, okay, these two designs, they are different, but, but do we get like any sort of insight of which one is better uh, in terms of these comparisons? When you look at the Betty and the uh, KFC, yes, okay, this, I know this design is different from that one, but uh, is there an uh, ultimate goal of, of okay, I want my Betty caves to be like this, then it goes to the next stage of my design. Or, or maybe I, I'm asking a um, complete like um, nonsense question. <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's actually a great question. So uh, I should have been clear. Uh, basically the coverage uh, data that we're looking here, these two scatter plots, um, they correspond to two different patterns that come from within the same design. So this is where we're just trying to understand the design manufacturing process. So the the IC layout, so the blueprint that we were looking at for these specific data, this came from a manufacturable design. So really what we're looking at here is maybe just trying to understand 
what types of symmetries um, are useful for the design process um, and the manufacturing process. You can definitely start comparing two different designs Betty plots. Um, I'm not necessarily sure whether you would be able to claim one's better just from looking at the Betty plot. Um, the, the goal here was just to get a sense of, you know, can we actually start um, better understanding whether one design is in some sense similar enough to another design, which we know to be manufacturable. If we can get some sense of that similarity, we might be able to sort of uh, better detect whether something's gonna be manufacturable or whether it sort of has too many configurations that we haven't seen before, in which case there's a little bit too much uncertainty. So we might not want to send it to like the fabrication plant as of yet. This, this is sort of the, the thing that goes into the design for manufacturability paradigm. You really want to do a lot of reuse. You want to reuse as much as possible, but still maintaining this goal of like improving um, the, the sort of the chip in either its speed or its size without having to go and trying too many to, uh, new, new configurations that you haven't seen before. That's sort of the, the, the paradigm that they use. But thank you for that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So Heather, are there, are there any, other, any other burning questions on your end or? or? There's one more okay. in my chat. Okay. Uh, do you want to take that as the last question? Yeah, why don't we do that as the last question? Okay, uh, we have a question from Mirzad. Uh, Mirzad, do you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, what uh, guarantee do we have uh, that the new design contains a uh, defect if it's too far from a previous design. I, I, I know uh, uh, you are talking about manufacturing and reusing, but uh, in a sense of research, I think uh, this makes uh, some uh, unnecessary constraints on designing. Uh, do you mind? So I guess maybe I misunderstood the question, but essentially here, we don't know how to draw a safe region. So we, we don't necessarily have the sense of like how similar it needs to be in order to say, you know, this is also gonna be manufacturable. If we have a configuration that appears um, in one design and we have another configuration, which is very, very similar, you know, according to some metric, you know, we still don't necessarily have a way of saying it's definitely gonna also be manufacturable or it's, you know, it's gonna cause a defect. Um, this is sort of the idea of trying to look at things at multiple scales and we're trying to use the tools from uh, TA to sort of at least give us some, you know, possibly like distribution of, you know, being able to say this is very risky, you know, making this configuration, this configuration is less risky because we, you know, especially if I have an entire database from a bunch of different uh, devices that have been built, I might be able to find some device where, you know, it's very similar, in which case I can have a bit more certainty. But it's definitely something where we want to be able to quantify this idea of like, how, how safe is this? Um, and we're hoping that this kind of process can, can at least take us in that direction. This is still definitely ongoing work. So um, I don't necessarily have an answer that you know, would be a proof that this is you know, definitely gonna be manufacturable if it's within a certain kind of uh, region of it. So, but th yeah, thank you, for, thank you for the question. Okay, thank you very much. With that, we'll close. Um, so thanks Yakub and all the morning speakers. Um, we're going to have a break, but first, um, Heather's going to have um, an announcement um, that hopefully will be of interest to many of you. I'm going to stop the recording.